Hello and welcome to a discussion on handling uh, large models uh, with custom weld, large welding models. Uh, so in particular, we're looking at today at, uh, you know, welds that have many, many beads. Um, so, so we're really not covering a case where we might have a hundred different welds. We're covering the cases where we may have four or five welds and each of those have 30 or 40 beads. So the question is, uh, how do we efficiently analyze those types of analysis? So like the one you see here has over 200 beads. Now, in this case, if, uh, you know, since it's axisymmetric, it's a pipe or similar to it, uh, but it's axisymmetric. So if the, the way the welds are laid down, if they're just laid continuously down all in the same direction, we could get away with running an axisymmetric model and get pretty good results. Now, that's not the case if things are not quite so axisymmetric as far as the way the beads are laid down. Then we really have to go to three-dimensional modeling. And that's where these types of models are, are, are would take a very, very long time to run with, with traditional uh, you know, transient heat transfer approach. So in the, the last uh, development cycle, what we did was developed a special application to handle these large uh, well, weld simulations with some approximate methods that um, Abacus, or I should say Dassault Systems, uh, developed for 3D printing. So if we take a look at this animation. So what we see here is an example. Now, this is not a very big model, only five or six weld beads. Um, but you see, this is our, our typical transient heat transfer analysis of a weld simulation. Here we have 150, 200 elements in the cross-section um, of, the, of the weld. Now, imagine multiplying this times a factor of 50 for some of the big weld models. Uh, it just becomes impractical. Um, this was probably four or five hours, if I remember to run this. Um, so what we've done is developed the tool. We, we've taken what we had available through uh, Dassault Systems AM, or additive manufacturing uh, capabilities, and we've just applied it to welding. And, and primarily, this is what we call partial element activation. So if we look at this, let's look at this picture down here. In this case, we have a very coarse mesh. The mesh doesn't even line up with the beads, if you remember. Um, so what happens is you have certain elements that may um, intersect more than one um, uh, weld bead. And, it, and it's kind of like with 3D printing. You might have an element in 3D printing that has 100 different you know, printing passes go through it. So how would we model it? Well, what they do is they partially activate the element. So they build up the element. Uh, it's kind of as if they're taking uh, one element and making it 10 elements. Um, so we've uh, done the same approach here with Custom Weld to, to be able to handle these really, really large models. All right, so we'll kind of go through the steps of how we would do that. So in this simple case, what we do is we start with a fine mesh. We build the model just up to the point um, where we've got the welds and the beads. So we, we do all the partitioning, we mesh it, and when we select the beads, we end up selecting the path and all the points along the path. And essentially all that's going to get stored and we're going to pass it over to a, a coarse model. And we can use the details of the fine model, but run the analysis with the coarse model. Okay, so the second step is uh, we go ahead and define a second model. We have a very coarse mesh here. Um, and then when we create the weld, uh, we're going to say the bead definition is, we're not going to define it locally. We're actually going to import it from the previous model, the model with all the details. So we just give the weld name, the weld material. And then what we do is we just pick on the cross section. Uh, either either cell faces or element faces. Um, and then the uh, at custom weld is looking to add an extrusion. So it's looking for either elements or cells that have been extruded and then it does the mapping over. So so the, the, the really difficult part is doing the mapping on the 2D cross section, but once that's calculated, then in the in the extruded direction, it, those calculations are very simple. All right. 
So um, we have some tolerances. We'll kind of see what these are for in a minute. Um, but essentially, this is all we need to do. We just say, OK, we're going to import all the details of the weld uh, from the previous model. And we're so that'll store all the the bead names and, and the paths of each bead. It'll calculate the volumes of each bead and the cross section and so on. OK. So when we when it does that uh, import, we uh, like I said, we store a bunch of information. We store the X, Y positions of the path. We're going to need that, the normals. And then uh, we're going to need uh, a lot of other things like areas and how they intersect. So I have put a tool in there to kind of make sense of what the mapping is doing. So um, so first of all, we we let's kind of refer to this mapping plane. So when we when you select on the course model, like I said, you're selecting the cell or element faces on what we call this mapping plane. Um, and then custom weld looks at the previous model that has been imported and it and it maps those beads onto this region. So what do I mean by doing that? Um, well, let's, um, if you open up, you know, when you open up the tree and create it, there's, if you right click on that, on that imported weld, you can say this, you can hit this display mapping tool. So let's kind of, kind of go over this, what this does. Um, so, if you look at the, the black lines here, that's the cross section. So you've picked on the cell or the cell faces, and what it's done is it it's just um, calculates where all of these elements are and then maps the old, you know, basically draws uh, um, the old or the, the imported bead profiles onto your mapped mesh. And then it figures out the, the areas and, and percentages of, of how much of the energy of a bead goes into each element. So for example, um, I'm just going to jump on to the next one. So if I'm looking at bead one, that bead one is made up of five elements. That's what these are, the intersecting elements. This is that uh, mapping tool. So one, two, three, four, five. Now you look at this as one of the elements, but if you look at it, it is covering part of bead one and part of bead two. So, so what this is telling us is that for these elements, these five elements, there's certain fractions of how, how much of the energy of the bead is going to each of those elements. So for example, this largest one, this is this one here, that's getting 30% of the, of the energy of the bead. The smaller ones, 16 and 16, that's probably these two, that's going to get 16% of the energy of the beads, and then these are going to get roughly 20% of the energy. All right. So, so this kind of tells us, you know, we've got this big element here, but only a small part of, you know, only a third of that area is actually going to get energy from bead one. And if we look at these dots here, what that represents is that's where the flux gets applied. So with the new AM capabilities, what we can do is we can apply a flux, not just to the entire element, but we can assign a, a flux to an element based on isoparametric coordinates. And then what Abacus does is it maps it over to the nearby nodes. So the, so what I do is I pass in the, cor the isoparametric coordinates at this point. That's the center of this face. And I calculate the energy that goes in there based on that fraction, which was probably six, 16%, um, and then that energy gets distributed to these two nodes. So it, it, I wasn't really sure how well this was going to work when I first de developed this, um, but I know that it was being used uh, by, by Dassault in 3D printing, and they were getting pretty good results. So I said, well, I'll just try it, implement it, and we'll just see how it goes. Um, so what, uh, in order to test how well, it really uh, applies. We go, b go back to that example, and we have um, some interesting things about this problem. And, and it's that what we're really measuring here, what makes this problem uh, a little bit difficult uh, for different 
techniques of analysis is that what we're trying to match is not only the stress field, but the, the distortion of the plate. And, and what happens is as the beads are being laid down, it's kind of zipping up the plate. So it's slowly turning into a V shape. Um, so we want to capture that. So if we look at the stresses, so this is, uh, let's see. So this is the, the fine mesh, and then this is the coarse model. All right, so we look at the stresses. We're talking about you know, 7.5 compared to 8.3. So pretty close, considering this is about 150 elements in the cross-section. This one's about 15 elements, about one-tenth the size. So we get pretty good, reasonable matches with stresses. Now, this doesn't always tell us much, because if we do this model with 2D, we can get just as good a match with stresses as this, but our distortions are nowhere nowhere near correct because it can't capture that that process of the, the beads being laid down and as they cool they they pull those plates together and they kind of zip up the plate and it and 2D can't capture that. So how well does partial element activation capture that? And that's that's our, our main interest here. So if we look at the displacements the, these are the, display, the the total magnitude, so we're talking about 0.16 versus 0.14. So, you know, not bad considering we've got one-tenth the number of elements. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to force one element to act like 10. Um, and, and so instead of having a job that might take two weeks to run, we could run it overnight. And, and all of a sudden, a lot of these large jobs become practical. All right, so let's see what the model will actually look like in Abacus, in, in Custom Weld. All right, so I'll turn on color coding here. Uh, let's see. Where's the mesh? There we go. So here's our, our course model. Um, Again, here's the here's the inf here's the information for uh, this one. Oh, this is sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. That's the reference. That's the original model with the six beads. All right. So there's our uh, original fine mesh model, and then uh, our coarser model. So our coarser model has all the information for importing it from the reference model. We picked on cell faces, uh, a set. Um, no, that this defines the entire bead, and then this option just defines the cross-sectional area, our, our mapping plane. All right. And then if we look at some of the info in a bead, usually in a bead we have all the information about picking, but here we just have XYZ and normal data and if we want to we can highlight the normals just to see so once we import the bead then everything starts to look very similar so for example let's this is a, a dialogue for defining the energies and how things go down so we have the six beads um, and if we want to put different dwell times for each bead if different energies for each bead we can still do that different speeds um, and then this is the size of the torch. Uh, with the partial element activation method, we have to use constant flux, and it's always put down continuously, so these are not options anymore. So as far as the size of the torch, the only real controls are the CF and CR. That's the distance along the length of the torch. So this all looks very familiar. Even though we've imported the entire weld, we can still put all these different controls on each bead. Um, and same with when we get to actually placing it. So if we want to reverse directions in some of the welds, change the cooldown times, uh, we do all of that. Okay. So let's look at uh, what this looks like. So what I'm, I'll do an animation of this what this is is that the partial element activation fraction so you could see the elements down here are fully activated 
these are partially activated as speed one goes now. Now that speed one is down, we'll go into the next speed, and now these are fully activated. Uh, again, this is the stress model. So we can see how the elements are slowly getting activated. All right, so here we're putting down a bead on the left side here. So all of these elements have been laid down. They're, they're active. They're just not fully active yet. And then the very last pass will fully activate everything. Okay. So here's our stress. All right. So, so it looks like, you know, very similar to the other welding problems. It's just uh, a different way of doing it. So the, what we really care about here are the magnitudes of the displacements. Turn this off. So we see a displacement 0.14 again was the maximum. So compared to 0.16 on the fully continuous um, finer mesh. So that's really the goal is can we get consistent distortions uh, even though we have a much finer mesh. So if we go back and uh, compare uh, our run times. So the original model with the continuous constant flux. So we're talking, you know, five hours to run compared to about an hour. You know, so, and imagine as we get bigger and bigger that that ratio gets even larger. So, all right, so that was just a quick um, discussion on how uh, we can handle some special, very large cases uh, of models with this partial element activation. So we can start thinking seriously about problems with 100 weld beads uh, and, and being able to do that practically. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact us at info at customapps.com, and I appreciate your attention.